Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters. I'm your host, Mitch. Glad to have you here. Here at the Commander's Quarters, we're all about Commander on a budget. Today, we've got an episode of Spare Change. Some episodes just don't fit in any of my other playlists, so this is where they end up. The topics on these episodes can vary pretty widely, so stay tuned to see what's in store for this one. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. And while you're at it, subscribe and review our podcast as well. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey there, Jeffrey. Whoa, what? Who's there? Well, Jeffrey, I heard that you wanted to learn how to play Commander. Well, that's true. But how'd you get into my house? Who are you? And it's Jeff, not Jeffrey. Oh, don't worry about that, Jeffrey. Just know that I'm here to teach you everything you need to know. Okay, then. Perfect. Let's get started with the basics. Commander is a multiplayer format in which you battle it out with three of your closest friends or even three complete strangers. But regardless if they are your friend or a stranger though, everyone starts off at 40 life. Gotcha, so twice as much as a format like Standard. Absolutely. And also unlike Standard, your deck has to have exactly 100 cards. That's going to be one legendary creature, which is also known as your commander, and 99 cards. Okay, well I guess technically there are a few planeswalkers you can use as your commander, and then there are partner commanders too, so that would be 98 cards and two command- just ignore that all for now, it's fine. Just know that for most commander decks you have one legendary creature as your commander and 99 cards. Got it! So the commander starts off in the command zone. It's kind of like it's part of your hand, but also not a part of your hand. You can cast your commander for their cost, and each additional time you cast them from the command zone, you must pay a commander tax, which is going to be two more than the previous time you cast them from the command zone. Once they are in play, if they were ever to change zones, you can instead choose to put them back in the command zone, but always keep that commander tax in mind. So basically you always have access to your commander, but it can cost more if it's been dealt with. You got it. Also, Commander is a singleton format, meaning that you can only use one of each card, unlike in Standard, where your max is four. Well, except for basic lands. And I guess persistent petitioners, rat colony, relentless rats, and shadowborn apostle. You get what I mean though. Other than those, this is singleton. But now let's move on to color identity. Your commander's color identity is what determines what colors of cards you can include in your deck. Color identity is determined by the mana symbols in a card's casting cost and rules text. So Talran Sky Summoner's color identity is blue because it only has blue. Samut Voice of Descent's color identity is Naya because her casting cost has red and green and her rules text has white. And Reese the Redeemed has hybrid mana, which counts as both, so its color identity is Selesnia since it has green and white. Okay, so I think I've got it. A card like Avacyn's Pilgrim can only fit into a deck where the commander has a color identity that includes white and green, so a commander like Reese, who's Selesnia, could include it. Yeah, you got it. And a card like Blind Obedience, I can't use in a Reese deck because it's got white and black because of that extort. Wrong! Wait, what? That's reminder text, Jeffrey. It's different. You can use Blind Obedience in any deck that has white. Well, now I'm confused. I said it's different, Jeffrey, so let it go. Anyways, now let's talk about how to win. So the typical way to win in Commander is to take all of your opponent's life totals down to zero. If you're the last one standing, you win! I mean, unless, of course, they have a Platinum Angel or Phyrexian Unlife in player or something. Anyways, most of the time when you get someone's life total down to zero, they just lose, like in other formats. One thing that is different, though, in this format is Commander Damage. It only takes 21 points of damage from one player's commander to kill you. This is kept track of separately from life totals, and there are decks who focus on that as their primary win condition, and those decks are known as Voltron decks. Okay, I guess I understand that, but why is it 21? It seems like a random number. Well, Jeffrey, you see, when the format first started, you could only use one of the five Elder Dragons as your commander, and each of them had seven power. So the creators of the format determined that if you were hit by another player's Elder Dragon three times, that was sufficient enough to kill you. 
But these days, can't you use cards outside of Elder Dragons as your commander? But of course. But it's still 21? Yes. Anyways, moving on, and of course you can still kill through Infect with 10 poison counters. Wait a second, since life totals doubled, shouldn't that double to 20 as well? No, Jeffrey. Aggro decks are garbage in Commander, and this is the only viable aggro strategy. Do you really want to take aggro players' only option away from them? I guess not. In Commander, every type of player should have a chance to win with the kind of deck that they want to play. Well, I think that's a nice way to see it. Well, except for mill decks, getting players down to zero cards in their libraries is impossible in Commander. Wait, what do you mean? You said that any deck can work. Jeffrey, forget what I said. Just know that mill is absolute garbage in this format. But I love playing mill in Standard. Yeah, it was a lot of fun when you only had to mill one player's 60 card deck, but try milling three players 100 card decks. And then someone just randomly has one of these Shuffle Titans in their deck and then you've got to start all over again for that player. I'm going to prove you wrong. Well, all right then. Make sure you write to me in 10 years when you finally won your first game with your Phoenix deck. Anyways, another viable way to win in Commander is by comboing off. With a card pull in Commander, there are an incredible amount of combos that essentially just win you the game on the spot. Oh, like those Consultation Oracle decks that I've been hearing about on Reddit. Kind of, but combos that are more fun and friendly like Phage the Untouchable and Fractured Identity. What's more fun and friendly about that? It just is, Jeffrey. Forget about competitive combos, just know that there are other more fun things to do. For example, alternative win cards are fun, like Biovisionary, Feldar Sovereign, and Maze's End. Those are so much fun. Oh nice! So finally a format where I can make a Battle of Wits deck work! Nope. Jeffrey, weren't you listening? Your deck needs exactly 100 cards. But that's not fair! Jeffrey, just drop it. Anyways, next topic. When going about deciding what kind of commander deck you want to build, you've got a ton of options. There are a ton of commanders to choose from, and there are many directions that you can take a lot of those commanders. Now, typically when deciding on your deck, you're either going to be picking your commander first and then choosing your theme, or conversely, you can choose your theme first and then choose a commander that suits that theme. What exactly do you mean by theme? A theme is kind of like a broad archetype for a deck. Some decks are centered around a certain creature type, others are centered around a certain permanent like artifacts. But there are far too many themes out there for me to go through in one lesson. The website EDHREC can be a fantastic resource to help with deck building and understanding what themes might be out there. And Scryfall is another great resource to help you find the perfect cards for your deck with your advanced search capabilities. Another helpful place is YouTube where you can get ideas from deck building experts like Mitch from the Commander's Quarters. I don't know, I heard Mitch is kind of a weirdo. He just builds budget decks and does really strange episodes. Jeffrey, how dare you besmirch the great name of Mitch. Someday you will learn to appreciate true high quality content. Regardless, when you start building a deck there are two things you need to keep in mind at the onset, and that is the strategy of your deck and how your deck is going to win. In other words, what is your deck going to do throughout the game in order to achieve victory? By keeping these things in mind, you can construct your deck in a thoughtful manner so that you can set yourself up for success even before a game starts. Well that makes sense. Hey, is there any kind of a template or guidelines that players use when building a deck? Great question, Jeffrey. There are no set rules and it really depends on your commander and your theme on what kind of breakdown of cards you might want for your deck. But there are some recommended guidelines for starting players. In general, you're going to want to have 10 ramp cards, which puts you ahead in lands or mana. You're going to want to have 10 draw spells, which generate you card advantage. And you're going to want to have 5 board wipes and 5 removal spells to deal with your opponent's threats, but this category probably varies the most depending on your playgroup and your meta. But again, the more decks that you build, the more you get a feel for what works for you. Awesome! I think I'm catching on! That's great, Jeffrey! So, any thoughts on who you want to be your first commander? Well, I actually used to play Modern, and Grishelbrand was my favorite deck, so I'm going to use Grizzlebrand as my first commander! Well, that's too bad, Jeffrey, because Grizzlebrand is banned in Commander! Wait, what? I thought that Commander was a wide-open format, and you can play with all your old cards! It certainly is, but not the cards that are no fun like Grizzlebrand. But I could have fun with that! It's not fun, Jeffrey. That's why it's banned. Anyways, Yes Commander is a wide open format where you can play with pretty much all your cards. There are tens of thousands of cards that you can use in Commander, but there are about 40 cards that are banned. Well, and silver bordered cards and, and anti cards, and I guess conspiracy cards are banned too, but yeah, pretty much 40 cards that are banned. 
So I'm skimming through the list that you sent me, and I think I understand why everything else on this is banned. Well, except for Iona. Yeah, to be honest, I actually don't get that one either. So then why did Wizards ban Iona? Wizards didn't ban it. Wait, what? Oh, did I forget to mention that Wizards doesn't control the Commander format? The Rules Committee is completely separate from Wizards. Wait, why wouldn't Wizards be in charge of this format like it's in charge of every other? Well, do you really want Wizards to be in control of Magic's most popular format when they can't even make a half-decent standard? Hmm, that's a good point. Yeah, Wizards is kind of bitter about it. Like how when the Rules Committee decided a while ago that only legendary creatures could be commanders, but Wizards wanted to push Planeswalkers like they always do. So they basically just threw a hissy fit and then just stamped the phrase, can be your commander on some Planeswalkers to make themselves feel better. Hey, isn't that just cheating by skirting around the rule to get exactly what they want? Yep. That's pretty sad that they stooped so low to do that. Seems kind of childish and scummy. Agreed. I mean, would having Planeswalkers as commanders just lead to very long and tedious games where they just tick up their Planeswalker, clear the board, keep ticking up, and then eventually ultimate, and then maybe get an emblem, and when they get that emblem, then they just win through attrition after a very, very, very long and drawn out time? Precisely, and that's why the Rules Committee never wanted Planeswalkers as commanders. Well, maybe Wizards actually should have listened to them since it seems like they know how to run a format properly. Now you're getting it, Jeffrey. Anyways, of course the Rules Committee isn't perfect. I mean, they banned Iona, but they truly seem to have what's best for the format in mind most of the time. Whereas Wizards is owned by publicly traded Hasbro, which has stockholders that couldn't care less about Planeswalkers as commanders, they just care if it makes them more money. Makes sense to me. Wonderful, let's move on. In Commander, there are certain unwritten rules. These are rules that upstanding casuals abide by. First off, no mass land destruction. In fact, no messing with lands really at all. Only bad people mess with lands, Jeffrey. And of course, no stacks pieces either like Winter Orb or Stasis. Wait, then how do I balance the game when the green player gets really ahead on lands? You don't. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Just play green, Jeffrey, and then you don't have to worry about it. Next up, let's talk about power level. Jeffrey, it's important to be honest about the power level of your deck. Now, it's actually impossible to determine the true power level of a deck because it's a very subjective thing. Then why do it? Because, Jeffrey. Because. Basically, the breakdown of power level is this. Wizards makes pre-constructed decks every year, and those are around a 5, so let's just use that as a middle-of-the-road benchmark. Anything below 5 is pretty much a random assortment of cards that you found in a box at your LGS, or a joke deck like Chair Tribal. Wait, Chair Tribal? You mean like a deck built around chairs? Yeah, don't ask. Anyways, between 6 and 8, you've got focus to optimize decks. These decks are built with synergy and built to win, but they still abide by the unwritten rules, otherwise known as the social contract. Wait, so then what is power level 9 and 10? Jeffrey, we do not speak of those players, and we casuals pretend as if they do not exist. Wait, what? But since I am here to teach you, I will speak the forbidden word of C-E-D-H. What is C-E-D-H? Shh, you don't want they who must not be named to hear you. Okay, then? They are the heathens that spit on the glorious social contract. Blowing up lands, locking up players, playing with the most broken and powerful cards in the format, it's terrible. Actually, that sounds kind of fun. Fun? Jeffrey, are you insane? Is it fun to sit down to play a game with the expectation of casual commander, only to get pub stomped by a competitive deck? I actually highly doubt that happens all the time. It's probably just a few bad eggs out there. Oh, Jeffrey, how naive you are. It is a known fact that competitive EDH was created for no other reason than to pub stomp casuals. That's definitely false. Jeffrey, you're wrong. It's completely true. How is it possible for anyone to have fun playing the commander format in a competitive way with the most powerful of decks, everyone agreeing to the exact same set of rules without a social contract? It's simply impossible. Okay, well, I see you've got some pent-up frustration and problems with this topic, so how about we just go back to the rest of the unwritten rules? Jeffrey, there are far too many unwritten rules to go through in just one session, but basically chat with your group ahead of time on what expectations are. Seems pretty straightforward and simple. Have you met other Magic players, Jeffrey? Socializing isn't exactly their thing. I think that's an unfair stereotype. 
And now you're being difficult, Jeffrey, proving my point. Well, that's just not fair. Anyways, moving on. Now, before a game starts, again, it is important to discuss power level and expectations. If you've been playing with a playgroup for a while, you generally know what power level of decks the others are going to be playing, so you can skip that discussion. But for a new playgroup or at an LGS, it is imperative that you have this conversation. You don't want one player to be playing an optimized artifact storm deck against a chair's tribal deck. Again, magic players like yourself aren't the most social of people, so this might be difficult, but I believe in you, Jeffrey. Thanks? Anyways, to determine who starts off the game, you generally roll dice with the highest number starting first. You take turns one at a time in a clockwise fashion. For the most part, the first few turns are going to be about ramping and fixing your mana. Other than Soul Ring, and I guess Mana Crypt if you want to flaunt your wealth, ramping on turn two is what you want to do. But what about Mana Rocks like Commander Sphere? No, Jeffrey, that's trash. But it says Commander on it! I said trash, Jeffrey! Anyways, from there it really depends on your commander and deck as to what your gameplay is. If you're running a control deck, you're looking to control the board. If you're running a Voltron deck, you're going to suit up your commander and kill through commander damage. And if you're running a Storm deck, your goal is to take a 20 minute turn in order to bore your opponents to the point that they concede. Sounds... fun? Indeed, Jeffrey. Again, there are a ton of different themes and archetypes to pick from, so depending on which one you pick, your strategy and way to win will differ from your opponents. The more commander that you play, the more strategies you will see, and the easier it will be for you to identify and know how to stop those strategies. But a big thing that plays a part in pretty much every commander game that doesn't happen in other formats is the role that politics play. How so? Well, Jeffrey, unlike other formats, commander is multiplayer. If you get to a dominant position too early, the other three players are going to team up against you and knock you down. You will need to pick and choose your moments in commander and make deals when needed. Doing a favor for one opponent early might win you the game in the long run. And try your best not to upset anyone early. If you want to attack in the early turns, just roll a dice to determine who you're attacking. Well, that seems kind of wrong to me. Why don't you just attack the player who's ahead, or maybe even the player who started first because they've got a natural advantage? No, Jeffrey. Always leave these decisions up to fate. Anyways, the length of a commander game varies, but it generally depends on the power level of the decks at the table. The higher the power level, the faster a deck can win in general, though this isn't always the case. I would say that on average, you can expect a game of Commander to take around 45 minutes to an hour with about 10 or so turns. Gotcha, so if I play CDH, I can get more games in because those games go faster. Jeffrey, I told you never to speak that forbidden word. And you will not be playing that, I forbid it. <clears throat> and now that it's been decided that you'll be a good person and play casual, let's move on. So Jeffrey, now that we've covered most of the essential basics, you should pretty much know all you need to build your first deck and sit down and play in your first game of Commander. Do you happen to have any other questions before I head out? Hmm, just one. How does that new companion mechanic work in Commander? Great question, Jeffrey. Yes, you can have a companion if your deck fits the companion requirement and your companion fits within your Commander's color identity. Wait a second, I thought you said that Commander's only got 100 cards. I didn't know we get a sideboard. You don't. Wait, then where does my companion go? Is there a companion zone? It starts outside the game and doesn't count as one of your 100 cards. So, a sideboard. It's not a sideboard, Jeffrey. It's a 101st card. So wait, if there's no sideboard, then what do wishes do? I didn't see them on the ban list. Wishes do absolutely nothing in the Commander format. Then wait, why aren't the Wishes banned if they don't do anything in Commander and they confuse new players like me who think that there's a sideboard because the Wishes are legal? That's actually a good point, Jeffrey. I honestly can't think of any reason why the Rules Committee hasn't done that. It really would make everything more clear. Again, like I said, the Rules Committee isn't perfect. Again, they banned Iona, but they are definitely better than Wizards. It's just like that old saying, better the devil that you know, than a wizard. Okay, anyways, back to the companions. I can't wait to use that cute little otter Lutri as my companion. Oh no, Jeffrey, the ban list I showed you earlier must not have updated yet. You can't use Lutri as your companion, or in fact, at all. It's banned in Commander. In fact, it's so incredibly broken that it's the very first Commander card to ever be banned before it was even playable in the format. Wait, what? What makes this cute little otter so bad? Isn't it just a worse dual caster mage? Jeffrey, let me explain. 
game. So out of the 10 companions, in Commander there are two that you can't use as companions and for different reasons. Yorion would require you to build a 120 card deck which you can't do in Commander since you have to have exactly 100 cards. So Yorion's requirement actually doesn't allow you to use it as a companion, but you can still use it as a commander or in the 99 of a deck. Whereas Lutri's companion requirement essentially is the exact opposite problem. Its companion requirement, each non-land card in your starting deck has a different name, really isn't a restriction at all, because Commander is a singleton format, so you're already doing that. Therefore, any deck that has red and blue would just have an unfair advantage, since there is no opportunity cost to run Lutri. They would just get a free 101st card, no matter how their deck was built. It doesn't matter that Lutri is technically worse than a dualcaster mage, it could just be a vanilla 3-2 and it would still be banned. I guess that's pretty unfair. But why don't they just ban it as a companion so I can use my cute little otter as a commander in the 99? Oh no, Jeffrey. You're gonna be one of those commander players, aren't you? What do you mean by that? Oh, nothing. Just trying to make everything more complex and confusing because you want to play your cute little otter in commander. Hey, that's not fair. But you know what, Jeffrey? What's that? What makes Commander truly great is that you and your playgroup can do whatever you want. Commander is the greatest format in Magic because your group can play it in the way that is most fun to them. So, Jeffrey, if you want to run Lutri in your 99 or as your Commander, just talk to your playgroup ahead of time. If they're okay with it, then that's great. Go for it. And if not, that's okay too. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it definitely seems like Commander is a format for everyone. Indeed. It is for everyone. Well, anyways, see ya. Now I'm off to build my competitive stack stack. Jeffrey, no. Did you learn nothing from this lesson? You get back here right now and build a casual commander deck.